Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the kickoff day for By the People, which is a brand new inaugural uh, arts and dialogue festival in Washington, D.C. It aims and throughout the world. Uh, we are also aiming to create places and moments for people to have substantive exchange and inform discussion and really reinvigorate our ability to have civil civic discourse. So today really is our, our, our day of uh, uh, dialogues to be able to do that. Um, we've themed these dialogues around the tenets of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As we all know, these were the inalienable rights given to us in the Declaration of Independence that the government has sworn to protect. Um, it seemed to make a great deal of sense to uh, format these dialogues around those themes. Personally, I think we could mine them forever and never not have enough ma material. Um, but it's just also incredibly important to remember that while these rights bind us all, we have different interpretations of them, and those interpretations deserve discussion on a regular basis. Um, we've picked a certain method for the dialogues today that I hope you will find engaging and interesting and then give us feedback about it because it's pretty new. <laughs> we decided not to go with the individualistic TED Talk style and we didn't want to bore you all with three or four person talking head panels. Instead, we're going back to our roots and we're going to hear from people facing each other in discussion, unmoderated, two viewpoints, um, connecting people from maybe two disparate fields to differing points of view, um, and really hoping that that will generate some interesting points of discussion and prove that it doesn't always have to deteriorate into argument as it so often does in our current online world. So with that, I really hope that you enjoy the day and, uh, and stay to listen to the different uh, dialogues that we have from now until about 3 p.m. And I hope that you will join us at various activities throughout the festival. We're at many different locations across the city, including Washington National Cathedral, the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building, the Ark, Walter Reed, and Union Market. You can drop into any of those sites, uh, find a free bus to take you to any of the others, and enjoy the arts and activities that you will find there. Thank you, and have a great day. Please welcome to the stage NASA research scientist at Goddard Space Flight Center, Dr. Avi Mandel. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, we hope you'll enjoy the discussions uh, that we'll be uh, providing. Um, as was just announced, my name is Dr. Avi Mandel. I'm at the NASA, a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center here in uh, Maryland, just north of Washington, D.C. My work at NASA focuses on the study of planets orbiting stars around suns other than our own. These planets are known as extrasolar planets or exoplanets. First discovered in the early 1990s, the study of exoplanets has revolutionized our perspective on how our own solar system fits into the broader scope of planetary systems throughout the universe. We now believe that almost every star has hosted or hosts today planets orbiting it. But the majority of these planetary systems look nothing like our own solar system. The discovery of planets around other stars, as well as the exploration of planets and moons in our own solar system, has all been enabled by the rapid technological progress of our civilization over the last 100 years. The Wright brothers first peddled their rickety glider into aviation history over in 1903. And the first Model T car rolled off Henry Ford's assembly line in 1908. Today, scientists work around the clock in microgravity on the International Space Station, advancing our understanding of how to survive and prosper in space, and preparing us for human habitation of the moon and Mars in the coming decades. We have multiple space telescopes orbiting both the Earth and the Sun, each working semi-autonomously 
to stare deep into the cosmos and beam back images that change our fundamental understanding of the universe. And in the same way that our great-grandparents marveled at the Model T, we now marvel at the capabilities of the Curiosity rover on Mars, which is five times as heavy as the Model T, but navigates the surface of another planet and conducts many cutting-edge chemistry and excavation experiments with tools that would fit in the palm of your hand. We are living through an era of technological wizardry, and it is enabling us to vigorously pursue the exploration of planetary environments, both within our solar system and beyond, all with the ultimate goal of determining whether life exists elsewhere in the universe and whether humans can live beyond the cozy confines of our own planet. So these are pretty heady times. However, in our excitement and at the prospect of new horizons and exciting discoveries, we often forget that this drive for exploration comes at a cost. Most, sim most simply, of course, the exploration of space is not cheap. A single launch of the Atlas V rocket that carried the Curiosity rover to space costs $130 million. And the rover itself has a full life cycle cost of $2.5 billion. While this amount is only one-sixth of the cost of a single U.S. aircraft carrier, it is still a massive financial undertaking. But more important than the financial cost is the damage that can be done through the mindset of unquestioning support of technological advancement and exploration above all else. Examining the history of human civilization and especially the history of Western civilization over the last 500 years, provides an almost unimaginably bleak lesson in the harm that can be inflicted on both the natural environment and on the needs and rights of underrepresented communities in the name of exploration and development. While we obviously do not know of extant life beyond Earth as of today, that does not exempt us from considering our impact on the environments that we visit. Just imagine if the red sands of Mars were replaced with the asphalt and the golden arches of your local strip mall. And if we do discover life forms elsewhere in the universe, we must be ready to examine our experience in encountering unfamiliar indigenous environments and populations here on Earth and understand how we can avoid the catastrophes of the past. In fact, the mindset of technological advancement above all else implicitly devalues, or at least has the potential to devalue, the wisdom and the lessons that we can learn from more traditional cultural communities, both current and historical, and about how to live in a more balanced, sustainable, and inclusive fashion here on Earth. As we invest more and more into new technologies that divorce us from the more traditional aspects of our lives, we risk losing sight of the importance of our communities, our traditions, and what it means to value human and non-human life. Today, we bring you what we are calling a dialectical discussion on this topic. A discussion between two people who have thought deeply about the implications of modern society's push for technological advancement and exploration, both here on Earth and beyond. Our two participants come from vastly different fields of expertise and different perspectives on these issues. However, we hope that they can not only find common ground to agree on, but also hopefully identify ways in which their particular disciplines can work together to improve life everywhere. Armstrong Wiggins serves as a director of the Washington, D.C. office of the Indian Law Resource Center. Born in Nicaragua, Armstrong is a Miskito Indian from the village of Carata, La Mosquitia. For the past two decades, Armstrong has been actively involved in numerous human rights, advocacy, and legal cases involving indigenous peoples of the Americas at the United Nations, 
the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. Dr. Lucianne Wachowicz is the Baruch S. Bloomberg Chair in Astrobiology at the Library of Congress and an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. She studies the ethics of Mars exploration, stellar magnetic activity and its impact on planetary environments, and a number of other important questions concerning the possibility of life beyond Earth. And I encourage you to go online to see her many amazing TED Talks on these subjects. And now I'd like to invite Armstrong Wiggins and Dr. Lucianne Walkowitz to the stage. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, great. Can you hear me too? There we go. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I guess, Avi, we have a bit of a, a set format for the discussion this morning. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll kick us off and uh, talk a little bit about um, really the, the setup of the question here. So today's conversation is about life um, right. and some of the uh, ethical and philosophical issues. Um, I know in the, um, the event call, and as you just brought up, this is often couched in terms of a choice that is uh, on the basis of money, of like how should we spend available funds. Um, and I think often uh, that comes up a lot with questions about space because it's an expensive enterprise. Um, and you know, Avi brought up uh, aircraft carriers. Um, but my, I think my favorite uh, statistic is that, um, so I, I work on a telescope that's being built right now and the, the cost of it is equivalent to what the United States spends in dog costumes every Halloween. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, sometimes um, it's easy to pull these like big numbers around. Um, but I think at the heart of the issue and what, what we wanted to talk about today were some of um, these meteor subjects like uh, the social and ethical and and even philosophical implications. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. And I agree. Um, uh, um, I think we have one minute to talk about that. Um, yes, I am. Uh, <clears throat> we work on human rights area, but uh, we work on the ethical, uh, legal, philosophical, and science uh, also from indigenous perspective, uh, our Native American perspective. Uh, so that I want you to understand that uh, within our planet, we're in a, we, we have a different philosophical point of view uh, that didn't come from Europe. Uh, all the isms that we call it, the capitalisms, uh, the, uh, the uh, Marxism, Leninisms, all the isms, we have our own isms here when European came. So we want to, I want to talk about that um, because uh, money is important, but it's not important to indigenous people as our life, how to protect each other, uh, our environment, um, you know, our basic uh, good living and how to live good. So thank you for inviting me here. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, given that I have a preeminent legal scholar here, <laughs> um, I, I think we wanted to talk about uh, some of the legal um, realm of this uh, intersection between exploring outer space and exploration of the Earth. So um, one of the things that I've been looking at in my work at the library is uh, the treaties of the past and also how that legal ground is changing now. So for many years, many decades, um, the governing document for space exploration has been the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. And um, the Outer Space Treaty is uh, essentially agreed to by every country that existed uh, at the time of its writing. Um, and it's, it's really a very... Um, an aspirational document. Uh, if you look at it in the most positive sense, it says certain things like um, that space is for the, the peaceful use of mankind, because it was 1967. Um, and that uh, you, know, you can't do things like own a celestial body, and you can't um, compromise the uh, integrity of a, another world. 
um, in such a way as to make it impossible for other people to use it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is happening now is that there's a, a much bigger investment in space by private industry. So private industry has always had a hand in space exploration from its very, um, very beginning. But now there's a lot of talk about um, doing things like establishing a military presence in space, um, more so than, than already exists, uh, doing things like mining of asteroids or the moon or even living on Mars, even transforming the environment. And I think um, when I speak to colleagues who have a, a sunnier view of treaties than I do, um, they often point to the Outer Space Treaty and say, well, you know, that, that will never happen um, because we have this Outer Space Treaty. Uh, however, I think um, in your, your line of work, you've seen how treaties can be um, changed or violated or even just ignored um, when the, uh, the interests that uh, want to do what they want to do, decide that they're going to do it. Um, so maybe you can, uh, you can speak to that a little bit here on Earth, because I know one of the, the fundamental concerns for me is that uh, if the Outer Space Treaty is ignored, that um, environments that have their own standing, like Mars, for example, um, will be exploited in such a way that we will never learn anything about life that might have existed there in the past or might still exist there today. Um, and I know that this is something you've, you've seen in your work. Thank you, Lucien. Um, I'm, I'm a member, I'm board member of the um, National Museum of American Indians. It's right here in Washington, D.C. And I would urge you and invite you to go and visit uh, the exhibition that we have about treaties. Treaties is very important. Um, you need to understand, um, <clears throat> when European came to this America, they were running from problems in Europe. And we welcome them. We welcome them because we believe in human beings. We believe nature. We believe in nature that every animals are humans that live in this earth and this planet. We must uh, live with them in harmony. Uh, but you know the history of cowboys and Indians. I mean, the, we are the bad guys. The cowboys are the good guys. Uh, that's how they kind of try to portray that. Um, and so they came here, uh, and we in the past can defend even with uh, bows and arrows. But they had more powerful weapons. And so we lost that battle. But what came after that was more devastating, which was the European legal system. In our, uh, our Ibi Ayala, Indians call it Ibi Ayala. The Western civilization call it the Americas. But of course, in the United States, this North American part between Canada and Mexico is the only Americas. But no, it's the whole continent, the whole Ibi Ayala. And so they divided up the Ibi Ayala between Spain, England, France, Portugal, and they bring the most devastating thing was their laws from there. Without respecting the laws that existed here, governments that existed here, because we, our system was no good. And so their legal system was imposed. Can you imagine you don't speak the language, you don't understand, you know, and that went to the Incas, went to the Mosquitoes, went to the Nahuals, the Navajos, the Cherokee Nation, and I don't have to tell you the history, how they divided Indians uh, by creating this legal system. Because we believe in, Indian government believe in collective and individual rights. European system, the legal system came only believing that human rights is only individual, not collective. Can you imagine? And so they start dividing our land. You, in the 18th century, what they did in North America is partially in Indian land, individual, uh, co not collective. And that is where 
in, the, in Native American lost their best land and they put them in reservations. And we didn't know how to defend ourselves because we don't know the legal system. And that's why our center is named Indian Law Resource Center. It's how to revive, how to do law reform and teach European that there were legal system here when they came. We had government, we had our constitutions. I would invite you to go to the Library of Congress that they're working on how many constitution existed before European came to this continent. And so my point I'm trying to make here about talking about the legal system, the treaties, we sign treaties but our treaties are not good from Western civilization point of view. Only their agreement, and I was, even during Obama administration, I was telling Lucian, I challenge Obama, because we used to have this debate when he was a law professor at the University of Chicago, you know, about our rights, about civil rights. And so when he talked about during the economic crisis when he become president, they asked him he said, uh, about saving these insurance companies. Do you remember that? Uh, why it was important to, because we have an agreement. And an Indian elder looked at me and he said, ask Brother Obama, what about our agreement? What about our treaties that we agreed? And now look where we are. We are the poorest of the poor in this very rich continent. How much that affected people. Are we going to do that in Mars if we find people there? Our planet that maybe there might be somebody? We have not solved our problem in this planet. And that's why I don't want to talk about the economic aspect of it because, you know, I travel from St. Mary's, Alaska to Tierra del Fuego, Argentina, working on indigenous issue and the Caribbean uh, countries. And so, I can speak from what we see. We have still in America, in our continent, in our Ibiayala, the indigenous people, what we call uncontacted indigenous people that still believe they live in a different planet. They strongly believe they live in a different planet because they have their own philosophy. They have their own way of health issues, you know. They don't want to mix with people from outside or come and bring their malaria into their system. I walk from Brazil to Venezuela with the Yanomamis, that they still don't wear clothes. They don't live from our economic life. But University of Philadelphia went there and they get their blood and they were selling their blood because they don't eat salt, they don't eat sugar. They don't believe in history, can you imagine? And sometimes what they say is that we learn from our history and we don't learn from our history because we continue doing the same damages. They say that the European came running from problems and they bring the same problems here in this continent. You know, and now, you know, what they're saying is that this, what you see happening today around us happened to us, taking our children away, telling us not to speak our languages, you know, and they develop legal system to take our land and our resources. And so this is what is very interesting that we should also say how can we back, make the earth planet better with our neighbors. Uh, aliens can be our neighbors too, <laughs> okay? And so we go and find aliens and then think that they are no good. We are bringing better things from this planet. Are we going to make the same mistake? It's challenging thinking. And I'm glad you invited us to brainstorm about this here because it's very, very, very difficult to speak about this subject. I can go on and on <laughs> in seven minutes. <laughs> so I don't know if I pass the time, but you know, thank you. 
Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, one of the things that I consistently hear is the same pattern of thinking that has characterized um, this uh, situation on Earth that you just described um, exists also in space exploration um, by not only, you know, corporate interests that maybe want to do things like resource extraction, but it exists also among scientists. Um, you know, there's a variety of different images of what it might look like to go to Mars. Um, one that, you know, Avi mentioned at the beginning is that we, we currently have robots that are there. Um, we have a, something called planetary protection, um, which is a set of policies about how well you have to clean a spacecraft to let it go to another environment in which you might want to study the life there. Um, so there's all these protocols of how well you have to clean the Earth bacteria off something like the Curiosity rover, lest you uh, contaminate Mars. Um, however, you know, the, uh, one of the, um, I won't call it a competing vision, but um, an alternative vision is provided by, you know, the marketing department at SpaceX, for example, um, who will show these science fiction-esque uh, images of Mars being transformed into this green, lush environment. Um, which anybody who's seen the, the changes to our own Earth environment, it's not a, a big logical leap to then say, well, you know, if we actually had the ability to transform global environments on purpose in the direction that is better for Earth, perhaps we would not be doing the reverse of that <clears throat> unintentionally, um, intentionally slash unintentionally, um, here on our own world. Uh, and so I think that there's um, a, a great deal of escapism, as you, you brought up, um, in the way that people think about going off planet, that you oftentimes hear um, you know, folks who are interested in promoting humans living on Mars talk about other worlds as though they are independent of these issues, um, as though one can talk about just going um, to another uh, planet and refer to it as like a frontier or any of the language that comes from um, American expansion and imperialism really all over the world. Uh, you, there's a tendency to say like, well, we don't know that there's any life on Mars. So, you know, and, and if there is, maybe it's probably just, you know, microbes. Um, and that I think, first of all, whitewashes the um, responsibility that we have to take, uh, to, to take full account of what has happened here on Earth. Um, and it's also just scientifically not accurate. Um, you know, first of all, we don't know whether there is life on Mars or not. Um, we do know now that the environment was probably uh, a lot more what we call habitable, which is a broad brushstroke for you know, probably moister and a little bit more temperate. Um, right now, Mars is a freezing desert, not a very nice place to live, um, even compared with some of the harsher environments here on Earth. Um, so we do know that it had a, a history that um, could have supported life, and it is still possible that it supports life to this day. Um, you know, we, we literally, our rovers are only capable of scratching the surface, like actually literally scratching the surface, like that much of the surface. <laughs> Um, so we know that there's all kinds of things like uh, methane in the atmosphere, things that we associate with life. It could be just geological activity, but it could also be life living in aquifers under the surface. We don't know. Um, so, you know, first of all, uh, even, if, <laughs> even if we would completely absolve ourselves of uh, the history of um, what has happened here on Earth, uh, we still just d don't know enough about this other world to make a statement like that, that we can just go there and do whatever we want. Um, and, you know, I think uh, you touched on this briefly, um, the economic interests um, that are coming into play now with like an increased focus on mining, for example, I think that's been um, something that has gone hand in hand with both exploration and exploitation here on this planet. Um, you know, we as scientists often say things like, we want to just explore, but we forget that, um, you know, intentionally sometimes, um, that exploration here on this planet often went hand in hand with um, scouting missions. So, you know, early trips over to, you know, unknown to European worlds that people got to do their scientific studies, um, but at the same time were part of 
that um, exploitation of the rest of the planet. And that's something that we as scientists should grapple with as well, that you know, we, we also live in this society and what we do has um, implications for it. So, you know, um, for me as, a, as an astrobiologist, like I, I would really love um, for us to learn more about Mars. I would love to discover that there is life there. Um, I think there are, are some arguments for human beings being you know, better at rapid decision making and improvising. Um, but I also think that it's, uh, it's not purely a technical challenge of keeping humans alive, right? Um, so you know, the, the literal impact of um, our presence on that world, depending on who does it and how it's done, that could mean the difference between discovering whether there was an independent origin of life off our world or not. It could have huge implications. Um, and so I worry a lot that uh, you know changes or um, backsliding with respect to some of these treaties that we have that um, might be employed in the service of you know people going to the moon, right? They, so the moon we don't think was ever able to support life. Um, so you know maybe you can do things on the moon that don't contaminate it in such a way as to compromise astrobiology per se. But then if you create policies that allow you to do things like that, what does that then mean for Mars? Um, and so I worry that the glossing over some of these issues will lead to uh, real compromises in what we can even know. Thank you, Lucien. Um, first of all, I like to say that. We, the native people that was here, are indigenous people, we call different names, are 100% humans. What I mean by that is that we have human strength and human weaknesses, just like all of us. And it's very important to understand that. Uh, I was not born today. <laughs> um, and I also travel a lot. Um, we also study Western civilizations. I am sitting here as an electrical engineer. I am sitting here as almost four years of medical school till the revolution come in Nicaragua, that university uh, medical school was closed. Uh, so I, I understand what Avi is doing. I spent a lot of time in University of Wisconsin laboratory uh, dealing with uh, uh, computer system that we wanted to make it smaller. Uh, there was huge computer we were trying to analyze. I, I, I was studying what is uh, television coming from my village that never seen television before and, and designing color TV and to talk about physics and math and technology and science. I mean, I am part of that, not just the legal aspect of it, or just from indigenous perspective. Uh, wh what I'm trying to say is that I do understand economics too. I understand philosophy, ethical issues as a, uh, as a, as a engineer, as a, as a legal expert. We, we understand that. And so all those rules and laws were developed from the Western point of view in our continent here. And so the economic aspect of what um, Dr. Lucian is talking about is also very damaging to our planet here, uh, especially an indigenous people. Our elders talk about when we were living here way, 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 way back before European coming to this continent. We were living in harmony. And then after 500, you can call it 550 years or 510 years, they come and then their main interest from our point of view is the economic aspect of it, to how to, how to take control of our land and resources and to make life very, very difficult. So today people talk about, even in the United States, we must resist certain aspect of certain government policy, okay? Well, indigenous people have been resisting for over 500 years. We uh, tried to go to the League of Nations in, in, in Geneva to say we want to be part of the world. And they said, no, you can't come. You can't be part of the world. Uh, United Nations was created in 1945. But only them can talk about us, but we can't go and talk about our perspective 
The Organization of American States was created in 1948, uh, but they created an institute how to assimilate Indians. So after 500 years, there will be no Indians in this continent. So we can do what we want with their resources. Uh, okay, they don't want to hear about our philosophy, our ideology that was here. That can be good. Our spirituality could have been used to maybe be make a better world. That was not, uh, they didn't want it even to listen. You know what? We have not addressed the Organization of American States General Assembly until, until 2016. The, our Indian Declaration and Rights of Indigenous People, we negotiated, I went to Geneva in 1977, we negotiated for 37 years, was not adopted till 2007. Can you imagine? So we're not part of the world body yet, although we have Indian government that's still functioning, the Navajos, the Cherokees, the, um, the Mosquitoes, we have our own government but they will not accept it in the world uh, conversation at the UN, not in, uh, here in, in Washington, D.C. at the Organization of American States, because we are not almost 100% human. We can't think like the European. All everything that comes from Europe is good, everything that was here is bad, and we're paying a price for that. And so I'm here to have a dialogue uh, in Q&A I, I, I don't like to, to confrontation, I like to have dialogue, as she said. Let, we're here to talk about it, thank you. <laughs> um, so we still, how are we on time? Okay, great. Um, yeah, you know, I, I wanna pick up a, a thread of something that you just touched on, which is um, the assimilation issues. Yes. Um, so one of the things that I think about a lot um, is the definition of technology. Um, so, you know, I think um, one of the, the continuing threads that you hear again and again, um, mostly driven by like narratives out of Silicon Valley, because Silicon Valley produces a lot of what we think of traditionally as technology. So the phone in your hand or your laptop or these screens, et cetera. Um, you know, I think that uh, there is a tacit assumption that more technology is always good. Um, I have, uh, because I have attended a lot of TED conferences, I have heard more than one talk about how, you know, providing internet to this, that, or the other part of the world is going to completely, you know, better their form of life um, in ways that are uh, really gross, <laughs> actually just gross ways to talk about somebody else's form of life. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, we should always be thinking about technology in a broader sense than just gadgetry. Um, you know, I think one of the, the failures um, that has happened in uh, modern science is to ignore uh, technological innovations and development that existed prior to us. It's not just, you know, like, oh, we as Europeans need to come in and learn about traditional life ways. Um, it's that technology existed here. Um, and, you know, technology is also not solely a good thing. Um, uh, there's a wonderful writer, um, Itasha Womack, who uh, wrote a book called Afrofuturism, who talks about race as a technology. So, race. Um, <laughs> uh, so, race is a, a technology that was used, um, you know, a, a, common question is which came first, slavery or race? So race was invented essentially to justify the use of um, people for an economic system, right? Um, and that, uh, there's a woman, Joanne Braxton, who's um, a scholar at William & Mary, who studies a lot of the intersections between the black and native communities um, in Virginia. Because of course when race came in, people started to be classified as either white or not white. And that meant that a lot of people, not, not just indigenous people, but also people who were brought here against their will, um, started to lose their identity, um, or, or rather to have it taken away from them, because they were simply classified not white, um, thereby putting everybody who was not of European descent into the same bucket. 
Um, so when we think about technology, um, you know, it, it really isn't just these gadgets or uh, you know something that we might build to explore another world. We have to think about ways in which certain concepts that we now take for granted are used to justify things um, that we might do even here on this earth. Yes, and um, you might know too that the we are no longer in resistance, indigenous people. We are now going forward challenging Western civilization because we do know that the civilization is in crisis in our continent and we need to help. Everybody need to help to improve, whether from the environmental aspect of it, whether from the spirituality aspect of it, uh, whether living a good or good living, uh, what that mean uh, from indigenous perspective. So we have our, now we have in our own summits, Indian movement is growing, coming back and educating each other because educated people can be also very ignorant about our issues also. Um, uh, because you, even today you hear in uh, MSNBC, they talk about Mayan, um, Mayan uh, dialect. Our language is not a dialect. Mayan civilization, that's a Mayan nation language. It's not a dialogue. If you really understand what dialogue versus language mean, okay, because there are millions of people speak the same language. Uh, that's a language and not a dialogue. And so even reporters need to be educated about what's going around the world. I mean, it's just very tunnel vision about issues. And so indigenous people should not be used as a cannon fodder for this kind of struggle between. And, and I went through that in Nicaragua during the Cold War. I've been a political prisoner twice during the Somoza regime by right-wing government and during the Sandinista regime by the left-wing government. And today we are in crisis in Nicaragua. Civil war is almost breaking out in Nicaragua as we speak. And so these are some of the issues that we need to try to analyze and help each other about think through. So my way of looking at this is that we need more of this conversation between every human being in this planet before we go to other place and do the same damage that we did here. We need to improve our planet. We need to help this earth. Uh, the earth is crying out for help. And if you talk to indigenous leaders when you, about the mining issue, the, uh, uh, the uh, petroleum exploration, uh, uh, energy issue, over those issues, they're killing Indians because they're trying to defend their land and resources. Instead of learning from them, they're destroying it. For example, in, in Colombia, their Indian community believe that you can't get oil out of their mother earth because you will kill this mother earth and they will commit massive suicide if you don't listen to us. And so we need to listen to them too. We need to talk to each other, thank you. Yeah, I, I think if there's anything that um, that really makes me hopeful, it's it's things like this conversation, um, uh, because I think that the um, the fact of the matter is that when you look at you know the history of space exploration over the past several decades, right? Um, you know, what does it mean to have uh, you know a science and engineering core uh, that is predominantly white and male still? Um, it means that you only have a very small fraction of voices in the room. Um, and, you know, I, I always think it's uh, comical when people make fun of, like, aver affirmative action as though you don't get a workforce that is all one demographic if you don't have affirmative action for white men in science. Um, so, you know, I think that um, even though the progress has been very slow, uh, science is becoming more diverse and more, and there are more conversations also, I think, between scientists and people who are outside the field of science. There's a greater sense, I think, um, particularly among young scientists of social responsibility um, and willingness to listen to alternative viewpoints. Um, you know, we've had a certain number of crisis points um, with uh, indigenous communities over like the building of telescopes, for example. And I think um, the increased um, investment in it being 
a, a dialogue on equal terms um, is, is encouraging to me, even though it's kind of not where it needs to be yet. Um, and so that, you know, I think I'm, I'm very hopeful about. Um, I, I would like to see us do better. You know, I, I would like um, to hear that the, uh, you know, this idea that is out there that science is like totally independent of culture and that it doesn't interface. I, for some of you, perhaps this sounds ridiculous, but it is actually like the major platform of you know a, a wide variety of thinkers. Steven Pinker is a big cha champion of this, the um, neuroscientist. That you know somebody's identity doesn't come into play at all. Um, but of course, we know from feminist theory, um, wonderful writer Donna Haraway. Uh, if you want to uh, read some of this, um, is that we have situated knowledges, right? Um, the knowledges that we have or the things that we know and the ways that we approach gaining um, more knowledge or even constructing the kinds of questions that we ask come in large part from our place in the world and who we are. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that kind of holistic treatment of knowing um, is something that it, I see again in many indigenous communities and I think it's something that you know, we here in kind of the dominant American culture could learn as well. I think that we, as a humans, um, we, we need to be aware of um, that, for example, um, <clears throat> we, racism is, is there because of um, a lack of understanding of each other. We can't get rid, rid of racism. Every, race have some racism in them. You can minimize it, but you can't get it completely. But, but if you get to know each other, I think racism can be minimized. A social issue or a class issue is the same thing. We had a revolution in Nicaragua to, develop, uh, to destroy class, and that revolutionary leaders become another class. You know? So you can minimize it, but you can't get rid of it. Well, in science, uh, is the same thing. Uh, I can say I am a scientist too because I went to medical school, I went to electrical engineering school, what he's doing. We can be very arrogant. We can be very tunnel vision because we only think about our interests. We don't really think, unless when you start listening to other people about the subject that they're working on, they say, oh, I'd never thought about it because we're tunnel vision sometimes. And that's true with doctors, that's true. Lawyers is worse. Uh, we call it the snakes, okay? Because they try to point little holes to hurt other people, you know? And so we, if we understand that and uh, try to listen to, to go out, you know, and learn from other culture, I was telling uh, Lucian that because we do a lot of training around the world uh, with indigenous leaders, I was in, um, uh, I was in um, many, many places and we realize that I know so little about this world. I mean, I know so li little about this world. And so when I was in Greenland, and I went there when it's six months dark, training with indigenous people there. And I went there when the time was six month only day. And I don't have running water there with indigenous community and it's very cold. And I come from a warm country. And so, I have to adjust to that environment. So we're talking about Mars. We don't really know that much about Mars. Just a little bit the way the rover is sending message to us. But that's it. I, I, think, I think that's, we still don't know our planet Earth. Many of you sitting here probably just know very little of the planet Earth. Even though I travel from Alaska to Argentina, the Caribbean, uh, you know, I, I went to um, Philippines, I went to um, Greenland and China maybe, uh, working with indigenous communities there because of the United Nations work that I do. Africa, I still don't know our planet Earth. And so thank you for having this conversation. Thank you very much and I'm open for questions. Okay. <laughs> Now we
we have a chance for uh, questions and answers. Uh, we have microphones at the sides um, if anyone would like to get up um, and ask questions. Um, so feel free to head up to the microphones. Uh, while we do that, I'm going to take the chance to ask a question of our uh, participants. Considering, as you pointed out, the, the sort of overwhelming um, dominance of these capitalistic and nationalistic forces in exploration um, in the past and even currently, how do we, people who are, are pushing against that, what is the best things that we can do um, to try to make a difference in both the legal and cultural areas of, of changing some of these, um, these directions or hist of our history? I believe that uh, as a human being in this planet, we need to think about some of the waste that we deal with in the United States. We're talking here in the United States. Mm. Just think about how many food you throw away every day by the restaurants and by ourselves, our refrigerators, and how many people in this planet is still very hungry. How many kids go to bed hungry? Not even in the United States. Six out of one, every kid go hungry. You know, we need to think about that. I tell my when I talk to kids in, in, in classes, you know, think about, you know, so many kids are around the world that doesn't have anything in their refrigerator like you guys have, and you waste them. So we need to start talking with our kids from the beginning. And, and that is true with respecting, you know, not just other human beings are respecting animals i mean if you if you have a dog you know you, you get to know them really well and how much you love them and they love you with no questions well if you have a kid i mean and you get to know them and you love them and the way you train them you know they remember that even when they're very very young they remember that whether you are a good father or a bad bad father or mother or whatever and so that reflects of our society how we treat women, how we treat other people with different color of skin, you know, how we treat other people that believe differently. And, and that is where we need to think about. Corporations need to learn. I was telling a corporation that just came to my office last week from Canada because they, had, they have this uh, pipeline that went from Canada to Texas. And a thousand... Um, accidents and they are spelling billions of dollars just to come into us to talk to indigenous people how to learn from us to not to make that happen because they pay a price okay and so these are some of the things that a uh, corporation needs to understand that you don't look at when you fly around there, you don't look at it. These are virgin land and nobody lives there. So I'm going to go to the capital city of that country and get a concession uh, without respecting people that live there for generations. Indigenous people are uh, peasants, are black communities. They don't go and consult with them. They only go on with government consultation. They don't go down there. We need to start thinking differently in that sense. So not to hurt people. Yeah, I, I would agree that um, I think that, as uh, speaking as a scientist, I think one of the things that we could do, and I apologize, I'm putting my back to you, obviously. Um, <laughs> Turn it around. Uh, is that, you know, I think we, we would do well to listen. Um, there's often a lot, you know, when we, we leave our labs and our offices, um, there's a lot of focus on inspiring people to um, become scientists or to learn about science. And I think um, <clears throat> sometimes that's in the form of just going and, and looking at it like you have to deliver some information about whatever it happens to be, black holes, exoplanets, whatever excites you. Um, but I think that we would do well to listen to um, the ways in which science does or does not serve that community um, and what the community actually needs. Um, you know, uh, like what is the utility of going and giving an astronomy talk in a place like Flint, for example, that doesn't have water? 
Um, and so I think that um, you know, science can be a wonderful, inspiring tool. Uh, I was thinking a lot during this dialogue about um, the movie Hidden Figures, right? Um, so Hidden Figures came out a year and a half, two years ago or something, tells the story of um, these three black women who contributed um, ir irreplaceable knowledge and work to the, um, the um, space program that literally made the moon landing possible. And you know the, the title of the book from which the movie came and the movie itself speaks to the fact that nobody had heard these women's stories. Um, and so watching that, you know, yes, it's a very inspiring story, um, but it also should be an infuriating story. And I think as scientists, we sometimes tend to think about um, things like that as being like purely about inspiration and filling in these like gaps in the knowledge. But, um, that exist about like the Apollo landings. Um, but I think also we have to understand that for a lot of people hearing that, um, that's something that's actually kind of angering, right? Um, like that decades have gone by and you've heard of Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and not Katherine Johnson. Um, and there are these um, sort of uh, fraught emotions um, that surround science in a lot of communities, particularly underserved communities that we really do need to listen to and understand. Thank you. First question. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I just had the good fortune to see uh, the reprint uh, released in 2001, 2001 Space Odyssey. Odyssey. And, and there's that wonderful, wonderful moment, moment when, when the bone, bone is discovered to be able to kill. And it's thrown up in the air, and it turns into the satellite. Mm. And it just cries out that there's technology that can do good, do bad, and it's all the same technology. And I'm just wondering. Um, Listening to you talk about different ways to look at science, almost in a subjective way, as opposed to just objective, how is the, what we look at as this is stuff we should try to understand, this is the stuff that is important to investigate, how is that impacted, do you see, by the movement of funding possibly from public sources to private sources? How could that impact what we call science and what we teach kids what we decide to put money into to understand? Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the sort of, uh, I'll call it an upsetting erosion um, <laughs> that is currently happening is that the influx of private funding, um, companies don't do science for the most part. Like they don't really do basic research. A lot of um, the research that goes on is usually in service of it being a utility in some way, right? And there's, um, you know, over the past year or so, there's been language inserted into certain funding calls or like requirements for uh, applications for funding for the National Science Foundation, which is public funding, right? That you have to make an argument about how it, your project, quote, serves the national interest. Um, and, you know, I think uh, this is something that comes up a lot for astronomers because certain things that we do are really just about knowing the universe better. Um, you know, you can say like, oh, well, the space program produced Velcro and Tang. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's a little bit of a, a shell game, right? Like, they're, like, exoplanets don't have a practical utility. They just don't. <laughs> um, however, I do think that, you know, understanding like the existence of habitats that might exist for life beyond our own solar system, let alone beyond our planet, um, is intrinsically interesting um, and something that we as humans should be curious about learning. Um, and that's not a big priority if it doesn't have practical use. Um, and so I worry sometimes that this um, increased private funding, meaning funding coming from industry now, I'm not referring to like foundations, for example, um, will be focused solely on what is practicable um, as opposed to gaining of knowledge. I can give you from experience towards your questions. Sometimes, sometimes that is better to understand um, for example, um, when I was talking about in Colombia, this Indian uh, uh, nation called the Uwas, when they decided to commit a massive suicide protesting, resisting 
the exploration of oil in their, under their territory. They were going to relocate them, and they said they're not leaving their mother earth because that's how they look at the planet. That's how they look at the world. And so the president of Colombia came to our center looking for help, how to deal with that. Uh, he later became the, the, general, I mean, the sec general secretary of the Organization of American States. And we still talk about that. So we went to Colombia to look into this. And basically, what the leader told me, and I learned a lot, is that look at your knees, look at your elbows. You have liquid that function your elbows. But if they pull my mother earth blood from the ground, how the plate is going to move? There's no oil there to move. And we were going to have a lot of earthquakes, you know, because they study, the white man study to make the money. The corporation pay a lot of money to study to get the oil out, but they don't study how to fix the earth when that problem come up. They don't spend money on that. Well, renewable energy is the same thing in Oaxaca. We got some support from Mitsubishi Foundation to help understand indigenous issue. They put windmills, right? But they don't pay indigenous people to put the windmill. They don't give the energy to indigenous villages. They give the energy to Walmart and Corona um, Bear Company. And so their interest is the money making and how to be, make their uh, investor happy. But what about the community that own the land where they put the windmills? So those are two good examples. Their interest is kind of more on the money aspect of it and the human people aspect of it. So that's where we need to balance that out. Thank you. Next question. You mentioned the portrayal of indigenous people in popular culture through the paradigm of cowboys and Indians, and the Indians were almost always shown to be a threatening force. How concerned should we be that popular science fiction portrays aliens as a threat to humans? <laughs> that's a good question, and, and that's my fear when we're talking about this. Uh, because, you know, even um, when you believe, if you believe in the Bible, the history, you know, th there are a lot of passages about you must treat aliens as your neighbors. But unfortunately, we don't do that, <laughs> you know. And so that is a challenge that we face uh, because you're right, you know. Uh, that's the popular culture way of looking at uh, Aliens uh, can, can kidnap us, right? Aliens can bring diseases, you know? And uh, it, it just shocked me this morning, I looking at this photo that somebody came out with the little kids, them that they've been um, put in a, 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 a place in a, on the border area that the little kid was there for, I think, over a month and somebody, only the shoes you can see, but they had on this thing protective that because they might get disease from this little child that was sitting there, okay? So that's the kind of fear we have uh, of uh, the way we look at, um, well, we are aliens because we're coming in from Guatemala. In the old days, we were not aliens. <laughs> we, were, we used to roam around this whole continent. I mean, but when they came to this America, then they decided, well, we want to kick the colonizer out, and so we want to get independence. So they divide the, the whole continent uh, in different names of different countries. And indigenous people were divided. Family were divided. The Mohawk was divided between Canada and United States. The Mosquito was divided between Honduras and Nicaragua. We didn't have no rights. They didn't even, they didn't even care. For the, uh, for the resources that we have. And all of a sudden, the land, surface, subsurface rights, the state has it, not us. We were there here before. They came. But now they own it, and they do what they want with it. We don't have no, no, nothing to say about it. So that's the, that's the we're the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the sad thing, you know? Yeah, I, I think for this reason, I really enjoyed the movie Arrival, um, because Arrival, if you haven't seen it, um, 
shows, a, I think, a wider range of reactions. Um, there is, you know, like the military that is terrified of the aliens, but there's also the anthropologist that is trying to study it. It also has like a very interesting um, non-linear time element to it that I, I you know, you touched on briefly um, earlier. Uh, yeah, I think um, this concept of the, the other occurs again and again in science fiction. Um, I was thinking uh, also that it, a lot of times the things that show up in science fiction um, are really about uh, promoting certain ideas in you know, our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I was just writing over the past, uh, last night really, um, about this uh, space force that has been in the news. Um, so uh, the president gave a address at like a meeting of the, um, the, space, uh, the National Space Council and ostensibly it was to sign in a directive that like does traffic control in space, which is like a, a pretty neutral thing. It's pretty crowded up there. Traffic control is, is good. Um, but I encourage you to go look at the remarks um, because it begins in the opener with comments on immigration. And in the comments on immigration, which I will not repeat because they are extremely offensive, um, the uh, connection is explicitly made that immigration control is, is necessary from the administration's point of view so that the industry leaders who are there, Boeing, Lockheed, and Northrop Grumman are all named explicitly and they're sitting in the room, um, can hire uh, people who have come in on merit, right? Well, first of all, defense contractors like basically never hire anyone, even people who are here with foreign visas. Um, so. You know, it, it explicitly makes this uh, connection between the fortunes of um, these like leaders in space and the immigration policy. And so it promotes this idea that uh, what you need is to seal the border, not only from all sides, but then above as well, and that we should have some sort of control over um, space itself, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense given you know, that nobody actually can create a border in space um, according to our um, hopefully not completely flimsy treaties. Uh, so yeah, so I think that sometimes those science fiction things that you know, nobody in that audience, by the way, objected. Nobody said, hey, maybe you shouldn't call immigrants murderers or, and imply that like, you're doing it so that we can hire them. Um, you know, everybody was content to listen to those remarks. Um, so I think a lot of times um, those fictional ideas are ways of providing this kind of like futuristic gloss on ideas that are really um, practicable here and now. And in this discussion, you seldom hear about the Native American or indigenous point of view about this immigration discussion. Yeah. They don't even go to that. CNN or Fox News or NBC, MSNBC, they never look out to talk get from Indian nation, what is their point of view about this America, they call it. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of discrimination that exists, even from the media, that they don't talk about our issues because we're not here like the blacks and the Hispanic. Uh, uh, and so we don't have that voting power, so they don't, they, don't, they don't even get their point of view about what's going on in these debates. Okay, so um, we're gonna have one more question here, and then we're gonna have to wrap up, so. Thank you for your dialogue. Uh, so quick question from your perspective, uh, Luciano, how do you think that your area of expertise from astrobiology can impact directly indigenous people? And reverse to you, Mr. Armstrong, how do you think that indigenous people issues can advance and, and help people, indigenous people, value um, science re um, space research? Um, I think that, uh, you know, from my point of view, um, and this goes back to my comment about listening, um, what I've been trying to do is fold uh, more indigenous perspective into my work. Um, because I think that there are natural parallels, uh, you know, when, when we have people talking about, you know, resource extraction in space, for example. Um, well, uh, if you want to do that on another world, that other environment has standing of its own, you could, you could argue. Um, it is a place that doesn't exist for the use of humans. Um, it is a place that exists and is you know, sovereign in its own way. Um, and I think that you know, when you're talking about um, what rights um, either indigenous life or uh, even just an environment, whether it has life or not, has, 
there are natural parallels between, for example, you brought up pipeline projects. Um, so Standing Rock is, is something that I bring up a lot um, where you have not only private industry, but uh, government and private industry cooperating together to do a giant engineering project that is not desired or beneficial to, and, and quite possibly harmful to uh, the communities that are, always, that are already there. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a tendency to ignore those lessons because nobody can like, point to a human being standing on Mars. Um, but I think that understanding the dynamics of what is happening in situations like that are important to fold in and to consider these other environments um, as you know, having standing in their own right, um, regardless of whether there's like a human being like, hello, please don't you know, build here. Um, you know, I think that that's almost, uh, you know, whether humans are there or not is almost a red herring um, in how we should think about the situation. I would say that uh, we, the indigenous people, are not against development. Uh, we are not against science. Uh, we are not against, in that sense, uh, economics. Uh, we are against the kind of development that European brought in this continent. We are against the kind of economic development that is not sustainable for our our planet. Uh, the the, we're against the legal system that only individual rights is human rights. That creates, uh, there are rich, 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 and poor, poor, poor. They don't think about the collectivity. They don't think about the village. Yeah, you have to look out for each other. One person can be billionaires, and others, the majority, very poor. Uh, the, the suffering of people by the colonization of Africa, uh, Arab world, the indigenous people here, and then they lo lose their culture. When people lose their culture, people commit all kind of crime and suicide, create that kind of problem. So what, what we're saying is that, for example, uh, I go and talk to my village in Nicaragua. I remember the first time when a jet plane fly over at our villages. People were crying the God, Jesus was coming, right? Because they promised that he's coming. Um, and, and so I went to talk to a group of young, young, young men and girls about the plane. And they said, well, but we can't fly those planes. Only the, the people that have blue eyes can fly that plane. And I said, no, you're wrong. And, and they said, well, prove it to me. I said, me, in front of you, standing. I said, why you say that? I said, well, I went to electrical engineering at the University of Wisconsin. Very, very hard to get in. And I didn't even know that I get in the first test I did. And I am a mosquito just like you from your community. I had the, I had the knowledge, I mean, I had, I had the fortune to know science, and I was able to do it. You can do it too. So that's the kind of thing that we, we need to understand that we're not against. We're also very curious people too. Uh, it's just that we need to sit down and understand each other. And, 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 and because we live in the same planet, if we're trying to go to another planet, then we need to be more prepared and not to bring the same devastating experience that came from Europe here thinking that only them was good and we were not good. I mean, we need to think about that. And the science is the same thing. These guys need to think about that. Um, talk to indigenous people more too, not just in that laboratory. Uh, <laughs> reading the books, right? I mean, analyzing, calculating, you know. Now we have science that we, easier for you guys than when I went to electrical engineering school. I used to use slide rules. You guys have it easy. Can you just calculate? <laughs> you don't know what the slide rules. You know, we can. We used to use our brain more than um, depend on computers. Uh, we used to be a better pilot. I used to be a bush pilot, so I know. You know, uh, now you depend on machine to land the plane. So when really hard come to push, you don't know how to take care of that big plane because you depend on computers. So that's, that's now we, we need to understand that. And I do understand that. We, we can help. 
That's what I'm saying. All right, let's uh, give a, another hand to our participants. And thank you, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.